and hello. Welcome everybody to Building Microservices with Ty. Thank you uh, for joining me. My name is Glenn and I think first of all we'll start with thanks to all the sponsors and people who made this uh, this off this possible. Thank you very much. Otherwise I wouldn't be here and you, whoever's watching this wouldn't be able to watch it. Uh, my name is Glenn. I'm a program manager on the .NET team. We're a lead PM team that helps build various app models and frameworks and stuff. Predominantly ASP.NET Core area framework and things like Ty that we're going to talk about today. Worked on ASP.NET for a long time. Worked on .NET for a long time. Mostly on server side, server side apps like APIs and things like that. Just not kind of web UI the most most part backend stuff. So let's get started with what we're going to talk about today. This first section of this talk is really about what we were trying to do when we created Ty. What problems were we trying to solve and why were we trying to solve those problems? Now, what we're, so the first thing we're going to do is boil it down to, okay, it's about microservices, this talk, but if we kind of really focus in a little bit, really zoom in, you end up with something very similar to, okay, I've got a web app talking to an API. In microservices case, it might be an API talking to an API, or maybe a rich client front end talking to a set of APIs, or whatever the case may be. There are many different slices of that, but fundamentally, you have two, in this case, probably .NET text, maybe some JavaScript and some .NET, and they have to talk to each other. How do we go about that, and how do we, what are some of the problems with setting up the dev environment for that today? Firstly, we have multi-project startup support in Visual Studio. You can right click on a solution. You can select multiple projects to start. It's not great. You kind of have to choose whether you're going to debug or not debug in the beginning, but it's there um, ish uh, in VS Code. You can do it as well, but you have to go and manually edit the files. There's no real guidance, no real um, rails for how you might get multiple projects to run at the same time, assuming you want to actually test it end to end where two things talk to each other, which can be difficult. Not all of your dev work can really be done with just starting up a single project. So first of all, we wanted to try and make that easier with Project Tire. We wanted to explore what that space was like, hopefully then learning things that we would roll into the rest of .NET or not as, as appropriate. The second big problem point that you have is, okay, if I've spun up two projects, I have Project A that wants to talk to Project B, now I need to have project A know the IP address, port mapping and such, the connection information to talk to project B. So that typically boils down to, I have an app settings JSON, some sort of configuration file and or environment variable, uh, or probably both, probably a configuration file that is overridden by an environment variable in different environments, which have that IP address and port. That's okay, you can set that up, it's not the worst thing in the world, but by default we don't really do much to help you out. We kind of scaffold all the projects to all listen on the same port, so by default you run both of them and they crash. one of them crashes, whoever's second crashes because it's trying to bind to the same port as the first one, you can go change that, and then they'll start at the same time, and then you can go put that configuration in. And it's not terrible, it's not the end of the world, but we thought we could make it better. Uh, one of the problems with that kind of configuration as you do it is when you change one, if you, for example, went and changed the port number or maybe you enabled TLS or something like that, every the calling project then has to go and change everything as well in your dev flow. And we thought we could maybe ease some of those concerns a little bit. Um, a bit, a bit, a little bit of deduplication, probably changing the amount that you have to set up manually, set up by default. And then the last, one of the last things, and this is almost universal as well, is, okay, if I want one of my microservices to talk to Redis and one of my services to talk to Postgres or something on those sorts, how do I then set up an environment that is good and that is reproducible and honors kind of the principles of what I'm trying to achieve here, like continuous uh, deployment and ease of setting up and cloning a repo and running? How do I make all of that happen nicely? And the answer to that is typically containers, right? I don't really want to say, I don't want to give a document to a new member of my team and say, Here's the readme that tells you how to install Redis, SQL, blah, 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 all of these things, so that you can then, depending on which microservice you're using, you're going to use different versions of those things, maybe, right? Which might be the case if you work on a couple of different services that all use different things, right? How do you standardize it? And how do you make it easier for people to jump around between service dev teams and various problems like that? Also, how do you make it easy to spin up and spin down, keep your dev machine clean, like all those things? The answer is usually containers. Um, and we solve this today, and which then leads you to this question, which is, well, Docker Compose solves a lot of these problems for me today. If you've ever used Docker Compose, it lets me depend upon containers. It lets us spin them up and down. It lets me 
um, have my projects and they use as DNS to kind of provide a level of indirection for that service discovery problem. Um, how, why is it, is it not the answer? And I think the answer to our response to that is, yeah, Docker Compose gets most of the way there. It does let you get dependencies. It lets you run dependencies easily for you, but it has a bit of a learning curve. It's a completely different DSL to what you're used to if you're coming from you know, a heavy, I just build .NET apps and I deploy them somewhere kind of space. And we think that Docker, uh, when you're devving your app, so like putting, in order to use Docker Compose, you have to have project A and project B both in a container during all of your runs basically on your local machine when you want them to talk to each other and that introduces a bunch of hurdles like you know the container is there as a network boundary between your kind effectively between your you your you running running your browser or um, postman or whatever like client you're using to talk to your um, service on your from your local machine it makes it difficult to more difficult to debug like attach debuggers because you're inside this kind of container sandbox um, and so we all, so we thought the best, the sweet spot, like the best of all worlds is let's, if we can make it so you don't need to know about Docker for longer, for further away. So you can get started, you can build your couple of services that talk to each other and we can push it further away to when you actually need a Docker file. In an ideal world, you wouldn't need to know about how to write a Docker file really for your .NET projects up until you really needed to customize something. And then you would be able to kind of scaffold it, get the one that we would have used and then tweak it, right? As opposed to today, if you want to set up any of this, you need to learn how to write your Docker file, learn what Compose is like, learn the syntax, put it all, stick it all together and start running. So it was about flattening that learning curve and, and giving you options to kind of pick and choose when you containerize, when you didn't containerize and what you wanted to achieve. So this is just a, um, a kind of recap where I've, I've mentioned all of these things, so not all of them, so most of them, in what you could do, what we've talked about today so far is the problems of today. This is talking about what you could do with Ty. We've talked about with the service discovery problem, we have some configuration conventions for that. Um, it understands project files natively, so you can don't need to necessarily have an alternate format like a compose file or something from the very beginning. It has a dashboard to give you logs and metrics and such locally. We didn't really talk about this problem, but once you expand beyond kind of A and B, maybe you've got A, B, C, D, you've got several services potentially all interacting. It can actually be difficult to run all of them at the same time and then keep track of what's going on. So we've tried to provide a way to help do that with dashboard with this dashboard that we have. And you can we also let you depend upon Docker containers and you can and give you some deploy to Kubernetes support. This says AKS, it's actually Kubernetes. It doesn't have to be the Azure specific implementation of Kubernetes. So Let's first off, all of my, I'm going to get into some demos real quick, but first I want to let you have an understanding of the app. So let's explain this a little bit. The application that I'm using today is called the voting app. It is in the um, Thai repo on GitHub. So if you want to kind of follow along with all of my demos with this video, feel free to go grab that voting app. Uh, the only proviso is I'm using a branch of that sample. It's in the samples directory. I'm using a branch that has the authentication server set up just because I wanted to show kind of another microservice-y thing, um, not so much uh, where auth was its own service. It doesn't actually affect the app in any way, so it doesn't. you don't need to worry about grabbing that branch if you don't want to. But the uh, fundamentals of this is you have one web app called Votes. It gives you two buttons, dog and cat. You can vote for which one you like the best, dogs or cats. It puts a thing into Redis. There's a worker which will take that from Redis and it will update a Postgres database. And then there's a results web app which generates kind of a pie chart showing you the results of all the votes. And in order to access the results, you need to go through the auth gateway from the auth service, which is a dedicated service. You could, or we could have also have um, if now then if that which sets us up ready to like if I added a more stuff here, I would be able to have them auth via the same auth service. So I'm not kind of doing auth independently in the results app, if that makes sense. So that's the basics of the app, just so that you understand. There's three projects, oh, four projects. There's the auth service, votes and results front end, and then this worker back end, which is just basically transferring messages around. Okay, so let's demo what that would look like. So I have the code here. I have results vote worker. Okay, and I'm just going to now take you through all of the local dev, what it's like using Ty for a local project. So first of all, I'm 
tie running this sample app. It's in the that the we had. I'm using dtie rather than tie the command just because dtie is the command we set up when using your local dev version of tie. So the tie that I'm running here is a little bit slower to start up because it's actually doing a build of my, like a run of my local tie running on my local machine rather than the pre-built released ones. I'm doing that just for a couple because of a couple of tweaks I've made that we haven't quite merged back in yet. And I'll call those out when we, um, when we when we get to seeing them. So the first thing that happens here is I do run and it runs and it has run my application. So what did that do? Well, first it gave me this dashboard link which lets me explore everything. And today, since I'm using VS Code, I actually have this extension that we haven't um, released yet, but we will be soon, maybe by the time you watch this video, if not, probably not that far afterwards, where I can see a dashboard which this gives me a link over here. Um, and the dashboard lets me, which is the same link I would have seen in the in the CS Proj, um, this lets me see all of my projects. So you can see I've got a vote project running, I've got a Redis container running, a worker, my worker project, I've got Postgres, I've got results. And what's interesting here is if I bring over my Docker UX, you can see that I have the red, these Redis and my Postgres are running as containers, but I'm not running um, the other projects actually as the projects aren't running in these proxy containers here. So I'm not actually containerizing my uh, projects. I am just running them locally with effectively a .NET run, but with containers, it's doing a Docker run. So they are running in a container. In here, I can view the logs for any one of these projects. I can clear the logs if I wanted to. Um, I can, so for example, I could come into my worker here and say, you know, is my worker running okay? See any problems that are happening? I could also view uh, metrics. So this gives me the metrics for each instance. So I can actually spin up multiple instances of any of my projects to test out having a couple of them running at the same time in case I had some bug or wanted to try and test that out. So these, this, this lets me filter by which of the actual processes are running on my machine. Right. And this gives me the this gives me a local setup. So just to land exactly what this thing looks like, um, if I go here, I can see I have dogs for dogs and cats. I can vote for one or the other. And if I were to come over to results, then I can see you can see identity server has said no, you can't access that without logging in. And if I was to log in here, it would show me the pie chart. So that's first of all what you get with the dashboard, which you can browse to. Uh, this tooling, I think you should think of this here as kind of the idea of what tie will be as we as we evolve, even if you can't get access to it, right? This is the once we've once we um, make this public, obviously you get it. Our intent is certainly to have things like this in VS Code and in Visual Studio. For now, we just have this basic VS Code extension, which I'll. Um, which I'll talk through how that's actually implemented as well, since I have a little bit more time, a little bit more time in this video than perhaps we've talked about in the past. So uh, that doc, that tie run gives me all of this stuff. How does that work? How does it, where does all that information come from? Well, I have this YAML file called tie YAML. Now, if I didn't need any of the database dependencies, the Postgres or, or such, and I didn't want ingress, so that when I deployed to Kubernetes, I would have publicly be able to publicly access my thing. I wouldn't need a tie YAML. You can tie run a solution file on its own and it'll just run all the projects in that solution for you. But because this is already a full working solution, we have everything in our tie YAML. So in here we say, okay, vote, vote. This is the vote, this is the project where I can vote for a cat or a dog. This is the Redis database saying, okay, using the Redis image that's on Docker Hub. This is the port that it's going to use and the connection string is of this format. This connection string is for the clients of this container to know how to get to it. And I'll talk about how that maps in and how your, how your app actually finds that shortly. Um, we have Worker, we have Postgres for the Postgres database, and then we have the results app. Um, and it has um, some, some, some information about how the public um, binding should work. This was to get auth, to get the auth service working and the public IP mappings working. So it's a little bit more complicated than some of the others you might have seen. And that's kind of it. Um, there's not a lot to it. It might look a little bit intimidating at start. There's not, there's not heaps in here though. It's really just listing each of the projects you want to run and giving you a little bit of configuration information. So, um, to finish exploring what's nice about this is if I come over here, I have all of my stuff running on my local machine. So one of the things I can do now is 
I could say, okay, my worker, this is a thing, this worker just runs in a while loop. It basically says, while I'm not stopped, keep looping, go grab any messages from Redis and then insert them into Postgres, right? So I have this breakpoint here. I can do now, I can say, okay, well, let me debug this thing then, okay? And I can just debug this one service out of all the services that are running. If I was trying to trace a message through, for example, I might wanna do this. Um, or I could debug all of the services. If I click this debug button up here, it'll attach to every one of my processes. I can view the logs for the worker. Um, or you can see here in this log where, as I, when I clicked that button earlier, it processed the message where I clicked on option A and option B, click, click with the same, same user ID. Right. Um, so yeah, this lets you kind of explore your application a little bit. You can get deeper information from the dashboard and then you can attach the debugger. You can look at logs and stuff like that. Even without this tooling, you can do all the things I just described. The difference is um, you would need to go to your debugger, click attach, and then in here find, you know, worker in order to attach rather than just having a button to click. So all I'm really doing is automating um, automating some stuff that you can do yourself anyway with this with this user UX and the um, browsing and going to the and the logs and everything obviously are all things that you can view via the dashboard. So there's nothing only here, it's just all collecting information, showing it to you. So um, that gives you how we set up the tire YAML and how what the how the tooling is just kind of automating a few things. I'll dig a little bit deeper into where it gets the information from in a moment. Um, but first of all, so that you understand fully the end-to-end, -end, let's look at the vote app. So you saw this user ex the user experience for this. It's just the two buttons: uh, vote for cat, vote for dog. And in the startup for this, I am calling this method. I need to get a connection string for the um, Redis instance that I'm going to connect to because when you click a button, it puts a message into, it adds a thing to Redis, right? The A or B that we just saw a minute ago. So I need a connection string to talk to Redis. How do I get that? Well, the we have this extension method on configuration called get connection string for Redis, this string Redis. And what that does is it goes and finds this basically. What is the connection string for the this name Redis? And this is so this is going to be my host name, whatever it is, colon this port, so that it's kind of not repeating itself, so that I can get that connection string. In my other application, in the uh, worker, for example, it's going to call the same method, but it's going to give Postgres as the name, and then that's going to give it this more complicated connection string where host and port and such are all in existence, right? Um, if it was just a standard API call, like a HTTP API call, you could call get service URI and just give it the name vote, for example, and that would tell me what is the IP address and port of vote. Because what happens when you, do, by default, when you run with Thai, each of the individual services get random ports. So this one here is what, 59392. Five, and if I was to cancel and rerun this, it will, it will be a different random port. And we do that kind of deliberately just to avoid um, problems. You'll also notice when I canceled then all the Docker images for all the databases and everything, none of them are running anymore. They're all gone. They're not using up resources on my machine. A little bit of hard disk space to maintain the image, but they're stopped because I stopped running the project, so I don't need them anymore. So now, but now if I was to rerun this and come back in here and refresh, oh, you see I have a different port number, 59575, right? Because they are randomized. Um, because I set up ingress, um, I do have one stable port. So this, this, so the get, so to finish that thought, configuration.get service URI will always give you, you know, local host, whatever the port name is. In production, when you deploy, you can, uh, the way the way this works, let me let me talk to you how this works so you understand how it works with, with um, in production is when running a project. Uh, so this is easiest to see when running one of the containers in here. Let me click this. See here how I say doc. The, this is the command to run the Redis container. It gets outputted to the logs. So it's just a normal Docker run, but it sets a ton of environment variables. And the reason for that is it's currently sets an environment variable for every service this might want to talk to. There's no relationships expressed in the Thai YAML, so it doesn't know, we don't know what Redis is going to talk to, so we just set environment variables for all the other services in the solution currently, because it might want to talk to any of them. We don't know yet. So 
this shows you the what happens when you uh, when Ty is launching your project. It creates an environment variable with the name of the service and then the word service and then port. Right? Actually, it's I think I think that was what it did do, and now it's this way around where it's service first and then vote. Right, service, so the, the word service, then the name of the service, then whatever the thing is that you're trying to get. So if I want, um, if I want to get the URI for the vote service, I go service vote protocol to get HTTPS, um, service vote host to get the host name, server vote host port to get the port name, stick them all together and I have a, um, and I have an address that will work to get me to that service, right? And that's what that configuration dot get service URI or get connection string does. It uses this these environment variables to get the thing. In the case of the connection string, it just straight up says connection string underscore Redis, right? So if you want to deploy to production manually without using any tie stuff, you could use tie locally. When you deploy the service, you need an environment variable of that's called with this same name pointing to whatever the Redis connection string is. And if you do that, this service will work because that's all it is. It's just stitching together of a convention for naming uh, environment variables, basically. Um, you could also put it in a config file if you wanted to because the, the it's using the configuration system. So as long as it's in the config system with that name, it's fine wherever it comes from in the, wherever, whichever of your config sources it comes from. Okay, so that's how configuration via service discovery works in your dev machine. You get randomized ports. You The dashboard lets you find everything, see you logs, see everything like that. Um, and the tooling helps you kind of make sense of some of this. So last thing is let's um, see how this works, right? So there's a API address that the um, that the the, the, the tie also spins up, and it is API forward slash v1, I believe. Yeah. So if you go to the dashboard and then you go slash API, this actually gives you JSON representation of everything that was running. So if I then go to this URI, this gives me kind of a set of URIs I can go to. If I go here. Now I get a document that describes all of my all of the services that have been launched, what the configuration for each of those was, what, and also very importantly for the case of tooling, um, things like what process ID here, this PID, see? So I have what the process ID on my local machine is, if I zoom in here so you can see this a little bit better. I also have what is the process ID, right? So that's how the tooling inside VS Code actually works. It just calls this API, parses this data, and provides you with some buttons on top of what this data has. Okay, that's and that's uh, that. Okay, so and I think that's everything that we need to talk about. It's basically everything Ty gives you from a development standpoint. Um, oh, Ingress. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't focus. I didn't talk about Ingress. So in the case of Ingress. Because I said, because I put ingress into the tie YAML, which I can show you, it's mostly important when um, when going to um, when going to be deploying to Kubernetes because it sets up the ingress rules in the cluster. But we also give you, which is how you know slash votes will go to slash votes within the cluster, setting up all that networking stuff between the front of Azure, uh, front, in my case the front of Azure, all the way through into my uh, Kubernetes cluster in AKS. Um, the but it, we also give you this local one. Now, the default by default, we don't go anywhere because in Thai YAML, I've set up my ingress as slash vote goes to the float ser vote service and slash results goes to the results service. So if I go slash vote, now I get to votes, right? And this port, this will stay the same because the 8080 is always the port of my ingress, my ingress proxy. And you can see here, I've got actually the, the ID of the host down here, the process by container ID, Glen PC. That's because this this machine name is called that. It's not a container in this instance, but this demo is normally run inside containers. Um, one of the features of Ty is you can do Docker run, uh, sorry, Ty run, and tell it to do Docker to containerize, and then it will run all of your local projects in a container instead of 
as a process, which is this is showing me that it's running it as a process, like I said earlier. And then this would change to be a different um, to be a different ID. It would be a container ID then a GUID. So you can try that out at home, run that with that command and have a look at it, and then you'll see how that these things start to change. But Ingress gives me a consistent uh, port and URI for any of my services that I want, but also more probably more importantly, and the reason it exists is it also configures the server when I'm going to do the deploy command, which we'll be talking about shortly. Okay, so let's get back to our slide deck and let's talk a little bit about how. Um, deploy actually works. Um, once we get through how the deployment works, we'll, I'll go a little bit deep into describing how this works and I may even show you some files on disk of how um, we create containers from your application and a few things like that. So firstly, when deploying your application, we start off with, we have votes, results, worker and authentication, votes, results, worker, author, my .NET projects. Redis and Postgres are both containers, hence the little cube and versus the .NET and such, right? And votes and results are Blazor apps. The worker is a worker. So this on the left here shows me the what each of the tech for all of my pieces are. And then on the right, I have a container registry square and a Kubernetes square. So when deploying to um, Kubernetes, I need to first of all, anything that I'm going to deploy that is my code, I need to turn into a Docker image and put it into an image registry, okay? The, we do this for you automatically. You don't have a Docker file. We basically invent a Docker file on the fly for you and then we generate an image and then we push and then we delete all that stuff and I can show you how that works as well if you like. So first off, we set secrets. Now, those two things that were containers, the Redis and the Postgres, we don't run them as containers in the registry, but in the Kubernetes cluster by default. We assume that Redis and Postgres, if they're not projects basically, that you're gonna to want to have them either running already or running as a hosted service. So in the case of Redis and Postgres, you wanna run uh, a Postgres database, uh, maybe a, maybe an Azure Redis cache if you're deploying to Azure or, an, um, or a hosted Postgres, like you're gonna want some service dedicated to keeping those and running them. Running them inside the cluster is pretty advanced. If you wanna do that, you can do that as well, but we're not gonna set it up for you. You'll need to run that, run the commands outside of Ty to be able to run the Redis containers inside the cluster and the Postgres containers inside the cluster and grab what their connection string is and configure it. So when we go through the deploy step in a moment, you'll see how it basically prompts me to say, what is the connection string for Redis? What is the protection string for Postgres? Then the tie will create what's called a secret in Kubernetes, which is basically an encrypted um, configuration key, configuration key value pair, which it sets, it decrypts and sets as an, or at least encoded, it might not be encrypted by default. So don't quote me on the encryption bit, um, but it uh, sets the 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 an environment variable or a file, depending on how you choose to set it up, with the value of the connection string. So this is how we take the two containers. We ask you for what the how to connect to those in the future, and then we set you a configuration option with the right name to the value that you gave us. That's how that flows. Then. On your local Docker instance, you have Docker have to have Docker running on your local machine for most of this to work. So then we generate a Docker image for each of the projects that you have. So the way we do that is we create a temp directory. Um, we do .NET publish there. We generate a Docker file from a template that's inside the Thai repo. It we then run Docker build, and we build an image on your local Docker daemon and wherever the your local Docker daemon is pointing to if you set up any sort of advanced Docker configuration. Then we do a push to a registry and we ask you when deploying, you can either put it in your tire YAML or when you do dash interactive, which is what we're about to do, we prompt you for what registry name you want to use and that will then we'll push all of those images over to some container registry. So they're in the registry, they're in a registry. Then what we do is we take a bun, we generate a whole bunch of Kubernetes manifest files, and then we and we create a deployment and tell Kubernetes that all of these services exist. 
We tell Kubernetes about the ingress rules you might want. We point all of those things to the container registry that we just pushed all your images to. And then we let Kubernetes do its thing in terms of creating services, just pulling images down, spinning them up, doing ingress rules, things like that. And then after all of that, you'll have a full working kind of app running on AKS and you'll be able to try it out. So let's see what that looks like, first of all. So we're gonna say uh, tie deploy, and I'm gonna say dash i. Dash i in this case stands for interactive, and that's because I want to type in at the command line the commands that I want. In here, you can put some of that data into this file if you want, so you can just do tie, tie deploy without the dash interactive. Um, we're gonna do interactive just because one of the biggest values of this deployment mechanism the way it exists today is just trying everything out, seeing if it works, spinning up my own cluster, testing it, things like that, right? So the first thing it's going to ask it did was verify that it's able to connect to the Kubernetes cluster. It uses does this using the kubectl command line. So if you can do kube cuddle kubectl get cluster info um, and that works, that or this will work and it will, de will deploy to whatever cluster you've got to be configured. So if you're using um, Azure Kubernetes service, which is the one I use most of the time, uh, you can then use the Azure CLI to get to set the cluster as active and that'll, that'll in turn set the kubectl and then you'll be able to um, then whenever you run this command it'll work. But the main point there is make sure that when you do kubectl get cluster info or get pods or whatever, that's the correct cluster and then this will work if you're working with multiple clusters, that is. The first piece of information that it's going to ask me for here is a registry. This could be your um, like a private registry um, or your, your own registry. It could be run. It could even be a registry running on the cluster if you wanted it to do a set it up that way because you could run the registry um, as an image. Uh, I usually just publish to Docker Hub because it's easy and it's public and it's fine. Um, some other people prefer private registries like an Azure registry. You can doesn't matter. You can just type. But in here, what you need to type is whatever the identifier is. In my case, because I'm using Docker Hub, I just type my Docker Hub username and it knows how to how to make that work. If I was to type a full URI in here, like example.azurecontainerregistry.io, Azure we would prepend our images with that. And then when we did the push, we would be trying to push to, you know, example.azurecontainerregistry.io, which also would mean that the Docker CLI needed to be logged in to be able to do that push to get to that private registry, right? Okay, so. That's how that works. Now it's going through and looking at what it has to do in order to be able to build Docker images and push Docker images for all of my projects. So starting off with vote, it's building a Docker image called Glen C vote. Um, it's got a version number and then it's pushing those images up to um, Docker Hub. What's gonna happen here in a moment is, yeah, so now it's prompting me saying, enter the connection string to use for the service Redis. So this is the bit that we talked about a moment ago where it's gonna say, okay, what is my connection string? I have a hosted Redis cache and I have a hosted Postgres server that I have connection strings to here. I'm gonna paste both of those in. Luckily for me, this is recorded, so both of these will be deleted by the time you see this. Now, it's seen here where it says binding production Redis secret. That's that process we talked about earlier where it creates a Kubernetes, a secret in Kubernetes for these two values with the appropriate names. As the other services, as other services come through and they, as the following services get um, deployed, pushed, this validating secrets will say, oh, there's already a, a, a secret of that appropriate name on the cluster. And if I had manually created this secret with the appropriate name before I did deploy, I never would have been prompted because it would have said, oh, the secrets already exist and then just gone along with it. Um, you'll also notice here as it's going through service by service and doing a push, it works out, oh, this is not a project, so I'm not going to try and push this and it skips most of the steps. That's how that we determine whether or not to deploy something based upon whether it is a project. We just to assume anything that's not a project is probably something that you're going to host elsewhere, otherwise, like in a different way. Um, and that's how we that's how we do it. So now I've pushed I've already now I've while I've been talking I've pushed the vote image to the registry I've pushed the worker image I've pushed the results image and now I'm just pushing the identity server image. Um, what is 
key here as well, like to just to reiterate this because it is kind of unusual, is I don't have a Docker file. Nowhere in my source code have I defined how to produce those images. Ty knows how to produce images for .NET. They're always mostly the same. They are uh, they are from you know from a runtime image um, to copy over the binaries, run the run you my run my binary right. Because .NET already does such a good job of abstracting the operator, the underlying operating system, it's not actually very common for .NET projects to require significant um, Docker files unless you're doing something a little bit unusual, you know, or installing things, needing things from the pack from the, the native OS's package register, package management system, for example. If you're maybe if you're you're running on Linux and you need some pack, some native dependency because you're doing something right. If you're doing anything like that where you need to apt get installed during your build or that needs to happen, something needs to be installed on the server in order to make your code work, then you're going to need a custom Docker image. In which case. We would use the um, escape patch of you specifying what the Docker file is, like to just tell us what Docker file you want to use, which you can, which you can do. The but by default, vast majority of .NET code that we see that is using Docker images, they're just using the default Docker image. They're saying, um, they're saying, you know, from .NET image, from .NET base image, either copy in source code and then do a build, or you know, from .NET runtime image, copy over the the runtime, the binaries that I've already built elsewhere. And there wasn't a lot of customization that really required Docker. So you want the images, you want that isolation and you want that guarantees that, 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 that having that image built provides, but you don't necessarily need a Docker file to do it. And it is still just as reproducible as having a Docker file in source control because a particular version of Ty is always going to generate with the same source code will always generate the same binary, same output. So now the last thing, and this is actually one of the reasons why I'm using DTI rather than Ty, is this IP address here, this ingress IP, that's not actually a feature of mainline Ty. Uh, it only exists on my machine right now. Um, but it tells me the IP address, the, the public ingress. So now if I come over here and I hit this IP address, I'll get nothing, same as I did on my local ingress, because by default there's nothing there. But if I go to vote, now I get to vote. And so in this case, see down here earlier, I told you I had container ID was Glenn C because it was running on my local machine. Now it's running inside this container, vote, blah, 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 right? The, these are generated, these randomly generated IDs. And if I say kubectl get pods, you can start seeing things like this ID and then this ID, right? SS8M2. So I'm running this this uh, this pod here for vote is this is serving this request on this public IP address. And that was all set up for me automatically because my Thai YAML said that I wanted ingress and it linked my services to a particular port, to, to a particular route, sorry. And then we took care of setting all that up for you. And then in this case, the in my version of the Thai it went of the Thai command, it went and found the uh, IP address. If you want to do this at home, kubectl uh, get ingress, is it? Yeah, get ingress, and it'll tell you the same the same thing. You can get um, get the IP address in here. But you'll be just being aware. The part of the part of the reason I added this is sometimes it might take a few seconds or even as long as a couple of minutes. I think the documentation says for an ingress um, port to be to come back. So be aware that that might be a that might be a be a thing that you have to worry about. Uh, so that's that gives you now a full, I have now my full app running in a Kubernetes cluster. And I wanna pause for a second just to let that sink in. So I have no Docker files. I have a Thai YAML that kind of, I mean, it's a little bit complicated, but that's mostly because of how complex I got. If I had say a web app talking to an API with a single database, I would have a very, very simple exit set up here and in fact I can show you that um, we have I can show you that because we have a sample let me go grab the the sample a sample tie YAML here in the tie samples repo so shrunk if I jump over here and I say 
just like this front end back end for example right front end app talks to a back end app now if i don't have any databases in here i actually don't need either of these things i can just use this solution file and if i deployed the same way i just did tie deploy i would still get the same everything was in a docker file everything was uh, running on kubernetes and in this case my tie yaml is very simple and if I wanted to add a database, I could add just a single database in here and it would be fine. Like if I wanted to say, okay, one of these uses Redis, I could do this. Right? And now I would have Redis running along with this thing. If I wanted to have ingress, I could bring in a relatively simple ingress, right? I could do something like this and say, um, and say ingress, I need to like what out down these. Um, ingress, name ingress, HTTP, and I could put like slash front end, and then it would go to slash front end. And now with this file, this would deploy my two projects up to my Kubernetes cluster, set up a port, port, uh, um, the appropriate ingress rules so that slash front end of whatever my cluster IP address was goes to the front end service, and the back end service wouldn't be addressable at all unless I was to kind of uh, port map into the internet unless I was to do some of the port mapping commands you can to get access to back end because I only exposed um, front end via this um, via this ingress setup right? so pretty cool um, gives you a gives you a pretty reasonable um, a pretty reasonable way of learning trying things out getting getting started with some of this stuff so um, if I use this though now to, to um, start up some other cool, just to go over some of the other cool features um, that we have, let me, this is a um, front end, this is Azure Functions with a front end and a back end where the back end is actually a Azure Function instead of a, um, an API. So I haven't restored this, so I'm getting some errors. We can go and we can go fix that in a second. But for the most part, I wanted just to show you the feature. So with the same with the same tie YAML, okay, I've got a front end and I've got a back end, and that's all. I can I say okay, Azure Functions. This is where my back end is in this directory with Azure Functions. And then when I do tie run, we will then spin up the, all the any infra local infrastructure required to run your functions locally and then sedan them up as long with your front end and give you the same ability to kind of talk to your Azure functions from your front end, right? And we also have an example here where it's using TypeScript as the front end talking to your talking to your, um, to your back end function. And then uh, in here, this URI, you use the same, the same mechanism to get your service URI as you would have used when talking to anything else. We talked about this get service URI or method earlier based upon configuration, which uses that config based kind of service discovery to kind of work out what the URI is to be able to then go and talk to the back end. Right? So functions, Azure function support. If you play with Azure function support, definitely let us know. One thing that it doesn't do yet is deploy the functions for you. That's one of the things that we're going to be working on. We will be working on soon. At the moment, it's only a dev experience for functions. You're going to have to deploy them on your own. Tie Ty doesn't do it all for you. Okay, so now let me. Um, that's everything that I that I definitely wanted to show you. So let me jump in and sh play with. Um, let me show you a couple of other things. Um, if you want to play along to try this at home, come in to the .NET tie repo. The example that I just had, and you can rewind and run through everything that I just run through, is this voting sample. Right, so you can run this. It has the same voting. It has the same voting stuff that we had. You don't need this anymore. This actually instruction was from before we had ingress set up, so I probably should go and edit that. But otherwise, all this code is the same. Um, I'm using a branch. The, the, I'm using the actual branch that I'm using is Justin's new voting one. So if you did want to use exactly the one that I'm using that has the auth stuff set up, then you can use this. Just be aware that you also need to use a dev version of um, 
you also need to use a dev version of Ty because I showed you the one feature I had that caused me to use a dev version of Ty. The other was this preserve path. Uh, we discovered when using Identity Server that we needed to add some features to these ingress rules, which have been which are in that branch, but we haven't kind of merged back into the main line yet. So if you try and do try and do that, be aware that that's where we're at. And then uh, the other thing, but otherwise try it out. Come in here, like check out the samples, try try running each of these samples, start basic, start with kind of front end, back end, and then play around with a bunch of these for us. When you, if you do, and I really hope you do, then come to the dashboard. Oh, I'm not running locally, am I? So I can't exactly. When you, when you uh, run your app and you go to the dashboard, there's a link for a survey and we would, very much appreciate if you would click this link and tell us what you think. Uh, we w read the results pretty religiously and we also uh, try to contact a lot of the people who respond to just to talk to you about your experiences. As we evolve what tile looks like in the future, this survey is definitely going to guide that what, that, what that experience will be like. So, um, thank you and see you soon. Thanks for uh, watching my talk. I hope it was good and informational and, and, that, you, and that you liked it. Uh, the future of Thai uh, is somewhat up to all of you people who try it out and give us the survey results and let us talk to you and talk to us on GitHub and get involved with the project as we work it out. Uh, what our plans are is to try and work out over the course of the next few months is what parts of Thai should just be the way .NET works, what parts should stay their own distinct project, and what other parts of the containers and cloud native or .NET ecosystems should Thai have kind of native or native support for or extensibility points to allow those things to plug into. All those things are being worked out on. We only really have, over the last, over the last release, we've kind of just been chipping away with a very small amount of work to get it to get it up and running and prove out the concepts where it goes today where it goes from here is really the question and where you really want your feedback in order to be able to work that out so if you think this might be something that interests you either for microservices or otherwise because we think a lot of the features of Thai are actually fairly universal then go try it out and let us know and tell us what you think and thank you